Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. When the devil tempted our first parents in the Garden of Eden, he told Eve that they wouldn't surely die if they ate from the tree that was in the midst of the garden. And in fact, he went as far to tell them, if you eat this, you will be like God. What Adam and Eve failed to realize, though, was that they were already like God. For God had created them in his image, in his likeness. They lived in perfect righteousness, perfect wisdom, and perfect holiness. But the devil's temptation was, be, was to be discontent with what God had given them, and then also to disbelieve God's word about eating from the tree. The devil was, in effect, telling them that they shouldn't consider it robbery to try to be equal with God. And so they ate of the fruit. And they plunged themselves and their entire race with them into the slavery of sin, into the corruption of the flesh, into the liability of debt, and the oppression of the devil. And ever since then, mankind has been living in that sinful pride, exalting itself above God, trying to be its own God, trying to be equal with God. Whether it's something outward and showy like a Tower of Babel, or whether it's something inward like the self-righteousness of the Pharisees, which wants to believe that we can be righteous apart from God's gift, all of it, all of it, and everything in between is simply the sinful nature trying to be like God. To undo the pride of Adam and Eve, to undo the pride that we all by nature live in because of our flesh, God sends his only begotten Son into our flesh. In the epistle appointed for today, St. Paul says that Jesus Christ is the form of God, or they're in the form of God, meaning that he is divine, because he is the only begotten Son of God. He is like the Father in all ways. But it's more than a mere likeness. It's more than just an affinity to the Father. He is, as we confessed in the Nicene Creed, of the same substance as the Father. Because he is the perfect image of God. And so we can say to Philip in John 14, 9, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Being in the form of God, that is, as we confess, God from God, light from light, very God from very God, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God because he was equal with God the Father. In fact, when he claimed this during his ministry, the Jews sought to kill him. John tells us in his gospel, they sought to kill him because he had said that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. It was sin for Adam and Eve to strive for equality with God because they were creatures. But for God's Son, eternally begotten of the Father, it wasn't robbery at all. That's what he is by nature. Because Adam and Eve tried to grasp this through disobedience and fell into sin, the second person of the Trinity, our Lord Jesus Christ, made himself of no reputation, St. Paul says, taking the form of a bondservant coming in the likeness of men. God the Son becomes our flesh and blood, like us in every way except sin, human body, human soul, everything, in order to undo the sin of Adam and Eve, in order to undo the sin which we commit and the sin which we have in us, to undo their pride. He humbles himself. Literally, he empties himself out. Even though he is God, he empties himself of his divine prerogative. He still has his divine power all throughout his earthly ministry, all throughout his earthly life. He remains fully God while becoming fully man. But he empties himself out of his prerogative so that he doesn't use his divine power and glory to its full extent. And when he does, it's for the sake of healing. It's for the sake of raising the dead. It's for the sake of his disciples so that they might believe in him undo the disobedience of Adam and Eve and all of us. He, Paul says, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. 
The one who gave Moses the law on Mount Sinai is in the incarnation born under the law to redeem those who are under the law. He fulfills the ceremonies of Moses, observing the statutes and judgments given to Israel. He does more so in fulfilling the entire law of Moses where no one else is able to. Because of the sinful nature, we are unable to do the great commandment in the law and the second one, which is like it. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And you shall love your neighbor as himself, as yourself, excuse me. Jesus says on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Yet none of us can do this because of the sinful nature which adheres to us. We don't fear God above all things at all times. We don't love God more than we love others or the things of this life or ourselves. And we most certainly are unable to trust him above all things at all times. Nor do we love our neighbors as ourselves, continually, from the heart. And so Jesus becomes flesh, so that he may become obedient to the law, loving God, his heavenly Father, with all of his heart, soul, strength, and mind. And loving his neighbor, every neighbor, completely, fully willfully, from the heart. His obedience is obedience to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Because as the sinner's substitute, as the Lamb of God who bears the sins of the world, that's what the law demands. And so he suffers not only death, but the most excruciating death that sinful, wicked men can concoct, the death of the cross. And he goes forth willingly, not just outwardly, so that he's complaining on the inside against the Father, while not outwardly. No, even in his heart and his mind, he is going forth willingly. He is yearning to go for you, for your salvation, to suffer the shame of the cross, to atone for your sins, so that by his righteous life, lived in our place, by his innocent death, died in our stead, all who believe in him, may become sons and daughters of God through faith in him. He undoes our sinful pride and our sinful disobedience with his humility and his obedience all throughout his life. But we see this, and we meditate upon this chiefly in this last and most holy week of the year of his life. On the Sunday before his death, he enters Jerusalem on a donkey and on her colt. He is God in the flesh, and yet he comes in humility and lowliness. He sets aside all divine glory and comes in this way to show his disciples both then and now what kind of kingdom he brings. He tells two of his disciples, go into the village, village opposite, find these animals, loose them, and if anyone asks you anything, simply say, the Lord has need of them. By this, he shows us that everything that happens to him at the hand of the Jews and Gentiles has been long foretold. For everything that will happen to him during this week, being betrayed into the hands of sinful men, being beaten, scourged, mocked, spit upon, crucified, and dead, all of these things, then, happen by God's allowance and foreknowledge. And as we see the Jews and the Gentiles alike crucifying him, we know that this too happens according to the will of the triune God. For the prophet Isaiah said, It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. Everything written in Moses and the prophets must be fulfilled, and everything that happens to Christ to the smallest detail is foretold by the prophets. Even his entry into Jerusalem today was foretold by Zechariah, as Matthew points out, so that all this may be done, which that was all this was done, excuse me, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. He enters Jerusalem as its king, as the king of all kings. He enters this kingdom, or with a kingdom not of this world, a kingdom in which he reigns not over kingdoms of this world and things of this earth but over the hearts of all who believe in him, forgiving them those things of which their conscience is afraid, giving them his perfect righteousness 
so that they may be perfect in God's sight by faith. He and his kingdom daily and richly gives us his Holy Spirit so that he may restore the image of God in us, that true knowledge of God and true holiness, giving us this, all of this. He gives us peace and joy in his Holy Spirit. For this is the kingdom that he comes to bring. And because of all of this, because of his humility, because of his obedience, God also has highly exalted him, St. Paul writes, and has given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Laying aside the divine prerogative and being obedient to the point of the death of the cross for our sakes, God the Father raises Christ from the dead on the third day and exalts him above all others. He's already highly exalted by his divine nature because he is from eternity the Son of God. But now, at the resurrection and at the ascension, he is exalted in his humanity. And this, too, is for us and our salvation. For he is raised so that he may justify and sanctify believers so that he may raise us to new life each day, the new life of the Holy Spirit that walks in the Spirit, that lives according to God's commands, that strives to love one another. But he also then promises to raise us up to new life on the last day, in glorified bodies like unto Christ Jesus' glorified bodies. He is exalted in his human nature, so that we who had previously fallen and been cast down because of our sin that we might be exalted as sons and daughters of God and reign with him forever. Considering all this, this great redemption and salvation which our Lord Jesus Christ has earned for us, and meditating upon his passion this week, especially how his suffering undoes our sins and earns our redemption, St. Paul exhorts us, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The mind of Christ was humility. The mind of Christ was of self-emptying and self-sacrifice. The mind that Christ had during his entire passion and death was love for us. And that's the mind that St. Paul urges us to have in ourselves. And he even describes what that looks like in our lives in the verses immediately before today's epistle lesson. In verses 3 and 4, he says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. What do we see throughout his ministry? What do we see this Holy Week? The Christ putting the interests and needs of others ahead of his own by taking the form of a slave, by coming in the likeness of men, by dying for our sins to restore what our first parents lost and what we, by nature, are without. Christ has humbled himself to the point of death, even the death of the cross, so that by his atoning sacrifice he may give all who believe pure hearts, good consciences, and a sincere, genuine faith in him. Possessing these blessings And these fruits of his humility and his obedience. Dear saints, may such a mind be also in us. That we may love one another. And not just one another here, but all our neighbors. Since Christ has by his grace forgiven our sins, cleansed our consciences, and given us his mind of love. Amen. May the peace of God which far surpasses all human understanding, guards your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Please rise, we sing the offertory on